All right, hey, listen, I'm going to start with a couple questions. And so let me give you a few. Since you got your phones out, what's the purpose of your phone? Not just to check in. What's the purpose of your phone? Anyone? 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 How about this? To steal your time. Isn't it true? I mean, the screen time, mine just came up. It's like, whoa, what is happening? What's going on? What's the purpose of Netflix? Not much audience participation. That's okay. Somebody said steal your time. How about entertainment? What's the purpose of the masters? Somebody just said entertainment, yes, and somebody was just there, and I, she's wearing the nice jacket there, and we're all jealous, and we know you were there. Um, but I would just say this, competition, right? It's, it's about competition, and it always comes down to the final round. What's the purpose of, I don't know, let me think, Ikea. <laughs> Frustration. <laughs> because you have all these parts left, and you're like, I, it looks like the picture, but I think I, I don't know what to do with this, and... Hey, what's the purpose of the Cubs? Let's go baseball. <laughs> disappointment. It's just disappointment, and I hate to just break the bad news. What is the purpose, though, of the White Sox? <laughs> to beat the Cubs. <laughs> and 62 to 57, as they've matched up over the last few years, so we hope that um, you know, the Cubs are gonna, they're gonna catch up. Hey, how about this? What's the purpose of your dog? Companionship. That is exactly what I thought. What's the purpose of a cat? There is no purpose to a cat at all. And nothing. There is nothing. There's no purpose at Okay, <laughs> hold on. I got to pull it together. What is the purpose of man? Well, think for a moment. That's what I want to talk to you about today. And so the Westminster Catechism says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And so what I want to do is I want to let the Bible answer how and why. And so that's where we're headed. Whether you're here in person or you're online, open up to Romans chapter 11. we got a chapter in front of us, but we're only going to focus primarily on one single verse at the end of the chapter. And so if you're visiting with us, we're in a series we started last week. It's called Me, You, Us. And we've been talking about the DNA of a gospel-centered life. And that's what we're going for. And so I don't want to, uh, I didn't make it as clear as I would have liked to last week. Let me make it extremely clear. 11 weeks. The first five weeks are going to be about us individually. And what? That who we are in Christ. Last week we talked about our identity. And then the last few weeks of the series, five or six, are going to be about what we're doing collectively together. So we want to be reminded of who we are in Christ individually so that we can we can do what he wants collectively as a church family and as a church body. And so last week we looked at our identity in Christ. We're going to do a little review. I've asked you to memorize each of the verses, 11 verses. So take a look at Galatians 2.20. It simply says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's who you are. As you look into the mirror, Galatians 2.20, that's the tattoo verse. If I would have one, that would be it. That, that what? That, that Galatians, I need that reminder right on my hand that I'm not who I was. I am who Christ says I am, and he's living inside of me. Today, we want to go even larger picture of what our purpose is. And our world is confused. We're confused about all kinds of things, our identity and our genders and our this and our that. Like, listen, man, what's our purpose? No matter what, what and who, what, what are we supposed to be about? Well, that's what I want to go to. And so here's the verse. Let's read it together. Read it with me. For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever, amen. I want to give you four reasons to glorify God. And you're going to see them all right here. So let's go with the first reason to glorify God for the note takers is I've witnessed God's glory personally. 
I, I've witnessed it. I, I've seen it. I, I may not totally believe it's from him, but, but I have seen God's glory. You say, well, what do you mean? I, I say, hey, have you ever seen this? Let's put a picture up on the screen. Have you ever stood at the edge of the Grand Canyon? Who has? And, and you're just like looking out and, and there's just something about that. You, you just can't believe it and don't step over. <laughs> How about this? Have you, ever, have you ever gazed on a mountain? And maybe you like hiking and Jody and I do and you get to a top of a mountain and you look down on the valley and, and you can see for miles. How about this one? Have you ever done this? Have you ever seen and watched with your family, your friends, or even by yourself, just watch the sunset on the ocean? Or have you ever been to an aquarium and just looked at all the different colors of fish? It's just like, man, God's got an imagination. Man, there's no color that I haven't seen that hasn't already been dreamed up by the creator of the created. And how about this one? Did you see it last week? Did you see the eclipse? I didn't. I was actually working out at the health club and went out and I'm like, oh, I must have missed it. <laughs> Psalm 19 says this. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Even if you don't believe in God, You've witnessed him, according to this verse. Because, again, the created reveals the creator. I mean, I love watches. Got a few of them. Always need one more nice one. <laughs> but as I look at this one, Jody got me this for our anniversary. There was a designer of this watch. I, I don't question that. Why is it that we question that there's a creator of the world. If somebody had to design this, how could there not be? I've witnessed his glory. So let's get a definition of God's glory because I could do this. Um, you could describe to me a basketball. Well, it's orange and it's round and you talk about basketball a lot. Yes, I do. You could talk to me about, you could describe the chair you're sitting in. Hey, it's comfortable. And, and just FYI, some chairs here you know, you got to be wise. Some of the chairs, because of the way it's seated, some chairs are um, 18 inches, 19 inches, and 22 inches. And so just so you know, somebody's going, yes. So just figure that out. And I always go for the 22. And, but seriously, like you could describe to me the comfort of the chair. And I could describe to you this podium or this jacket that I'm wearing. I, but we can't describe this. Words don't do it any justice. Like, it, it's indescribable. This is something, God's glory, you, you can't quite wrap your head around it. And so some, a lot smarter people than me have tried to do it. And so let's look at this theologian and pastor. Look what he says. The glory of God is the infinite beauty and greatness of God's manifold perfections. I love that. Because it taught, he's perfect. He's holy. He's separate from us. That's why we can't approach him without the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. And so it, whatever is all the perfection, he, he's manifest. And then this pastor, he says it like this. Maybe not a theologian, but certainly a pastor. He said it is who God is. It is the essence of his nature, the weight of his importance, the radiance of his splendor, the demonstration of his power, the atmosphere of his presence. Like, I can do a lot of thinking, and I can't come up with anything better than that. It's indescribable. Maybe I would just add glory is to God as wet is to water, as heat is to a bulb, as light is to a lamp. I mean, that, it's just who he is. It, it's what he does. That, that's the glory of Almighty God. So the first reason why... We want to give him glory as followers is that I've witnessed his glory personally. Give me a shout if you've witnessed it. Have you? Come on, man. Amen. It is. And then the second thing, this is the deeper one. This is the I've experienced it supernaturally. And so last one, so, so put the second one on. That, excuse me. Please go to the point, please. 
Um, from him is the first one, right? That from him I can, I've witnessed some things. And then through him is that, no, he wants you to not just see, he wants you to experience some things. So now we're going to get deep into theology for a moment. So there's two kinds of grace. There's common grace, theologians tell us, and then there's a different kind of grace. There's what's called special grace. Let's hold on common for a moment. Common, let me describe it to you. It's the breath you just took. Some people don't acknowledge God. He's the one that gave you the last breath you just took. He'll give you the first one, he'll give you the last one. And it's all dictated. He's sovereign and in control. Like, it's, it's what we experience, whether or not you give God the credit. It, that's, that's, that's God's grace. That's God's common grace. Why is it common? Well, I just said it. I'm trying to help us. It's like I want to make you into theologians. It's because everybody experiences it. The, your neighbor, your friend. Like, it does, it, whether they acknowledge God is the one who is the creator of the universe or not. And so I love what C.S. Lewis says. We'll put it up on the screen. He's got a good way of saying it. He says, the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, the news from a country we have never visited. That's common grace. And so common grace, let's give this definition. We'll put it up on the screen. Common grace is the undeserved blessings that God gives to all people. So every single person gets it. How about special grace? Well, special grace is this. It's the undeserved blessings that God gives to those seeking, surrendering, and serving him. That, that's undeserved grace. So undeserved grace, or excuse me, it, the special grace is undeserved because we can't do anything. It's about what Jesus has done on the cross. Remember last week, it's not what I do, D-O, it's what's been done, D-O-N-E. It's not about human accomplishment. It's about divine, divine accomplishment. It's like, I can't do it on my own. It's only what Jesus Christ has done in and through me. So there's a difference between common grace and special grace. And so if you've experienced through repentance and faith a relationship with Jesus, then, then you're experiencing something different that you're going to give God the glory for. Does that make sense? So let me show you this quote. It's kind of interesting. Um, special grace is the grace that gives a son the words to say at his mom's funeral. Hey, let's just understand special grace. And I wrote these up because I, I think we've experienced this. Special grace is the grace that allows two people to restore a marriage that's filled with hurt and betrayal. That, that's special grace. Special grace is what? It's the grace that allows a mother to forgive the drunk driver who killed her son. Like, like that's, you can't do that on your own, humanly speaking. That's special grace, man. I can only forgive because I've been forgiven, and it's a supernatural encounter that special grace is the grace that gives you the strength to get free from that bad habit. Special grace, the grace from God, it's the, it's the grace that gives you the strength to love the unlovable and forgive the unforgivable. That's why Jesus said, you know, it's like, hey, if somebody slaps you, turn the other cheek and do what? And, and just... Jesus is the one who has taught us these things where he raises the bar for each of us. And special grace is this. It gives us a new purpose. It gives us a fresh attitude. It gives us an eternal outlook on life. And then how about this one? I don't take this lightly. Special grace allows me to stand before you each week and, and preach. Like, I can't do this on my own. Like a lot of, you know, come, oh, you spoke right to me. I didn't. I didn't. I, I'm not that good. Some pastors just won't admit it. I'm not. I, I'm not that good. God is. He's the one. It's his word. I've got nothing to say. He's the one that does it. And yeah, let's praise the Lord. Yeah, let, let's just, hold on. Just, let's, give, let's give God his honor. Let's praise the Lord for how lame I am and how good he is. Can we do it? I'll be the first one. I'm telling you. It, it's true. Too many pastors want to fancy and show you how smart they are. I'm not that smart. I couldn't do this. 
It's, it's, it's his grace and goodness. So now we got a couple quotes. I think I was getting ahead of myself. We got a quote here from Paul Tripp, which I really like. He says, if you're in Christ, you've been chosen to transcend the borders of your own glory, to reach out toward a greater glory, the glory of God. How about this from uh, Billy Graham's daughter? She says it best. Anne Graham Lotz, our ultimate aim in life is not to be healthy, wealthy, prosperous, or problem-free. Our ultimate aim in life is to bring glory to God. Like, that's what we've been created for. And, and we're getting all messed up. Our world is confused. And it's an attack by the enemy. Is anyone grieving this? Like, like we're all running around like this, and, and, and it's like, look up, and, and you have been given so much in the midst of the trial and the difficulty and the diagnosis and that God wants to use that pain to show people his presence in the midst of their greatest difficulty. In Christ, I can do anything. Christ gives me the strength to overcome anything. That, that's called the Bible. That's what Jesus, that's why he came. He glorified the Father and he asks us to do the same. So third reason, like I gotta convince you. I just feel like I'm talking to the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the choir trying to get you fired up here that what, that, that, that this is what we're called to do. And, and the third reason is that I love this. I, I've reveled in God's glory unapologetically. I'm not apologizing for it, man. I've reveled in the glory of God. Maybe I'm not reveling in it today. And maybe I've taken a couple steps back or a couple steps down but God wants to get me back to that place. Remember the verse we said last week that what? In James, that what? God wants to exalt you, humble yourself before the Lord. He wants to lift you up, no matter what trial you're in. And so we want to revel in his glory. And, and so this is the end to him are all things portion of the scripture. So are you catching this? The first part, for from him, that's I've witnessed it. Through him, I've experienced it. And now to him are all things. I, I'm reveling in it, unapologetically. Hey, who's the him? Jesus. He and God. The Trinity. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Like, it, it's just really important. I've reveled in God's glory unapologetically. So we're going to do a little Bible study. Ready? I only got one verse, so I got to make you do a little work. So we're going to do a Bible study on God's glory. You could spend the week looking up these scriptures and feeding yourself. Hey, we set the ball up on the tee for you, man. Don't try to go do a Bible study for, uh, you know, oh, I'm having trouble. What do I do with my wife? I'm a spiritual leader in my house. What do I do with my kids? Hey, just, just go through these verses. Talk about God's glory this week. Amen? Like we're setting it up on the tee for you. Just trying to get rid of all those Masters um, tournament <laughs> illustrations, but they're just coming. Okay, first thing is this. God's glory. When it comes to his glory... God's glory leads God's people. So we just got to understand, we see that in Exodus, that a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. That's the Lord went before them. And he was in a pillar of cloud. And if you keep reading in the Old Testament, in Exodus, you see that it says it was the glory of the Lord that filled the tabernacle. And so the pillar of the cloud, it was the glory of the Lord. And it led the people of God. God shares his glory with no one. That's what comes next is he's not sharing his glory with anyone. That's not what he does. I'm the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, or nor my praise to carved idols. Like God's not looking to share his glory. He's looking to reflect it. We're like the moon, and so we're to reflect. We have no sun in ourselves. We're to reflect the glory of God. How about Moses? Um, if, if you were raised in church and you've been to Bible study, uh, or um, Sunday school. You'll remember the story about Moses is like, God, I want to see your face. Anybody remember that? God, I want to see your face. And he's saying, I want to see your glory. And, and what does God do? He's like, <laughs> well, no man will see my face or they're going to die. But then God in his grace and his infinite wisdom, because he wanted him to get a little glimpse, he put him in the cleft of the rock. And it's kind of funny if you think about it. So he's kind of got, you know, in the rock like this. His nose is in the you know, stone. And then he says, once I walk by, he says, you can see my behind my glory. You'll see my glory pass by you. 
And so God's not sharing his glory. We're like moons to reflect the glory of God. We have no light in and of ourselves. Um, men love darkness rather than light. Next, that what? That God, God doesn't share it. Jesus reveals God's glory. So how can we know it? We're not Moses. You're not getting in a cleft. Like you can see it. That's why the Bible's so important. And, and that's why we're so committed to going through the scriptures. That, that, that if I read about Jesus, it gives me the perfect picture of God's glory and what he did and how he responded. And man, it's just like, anybody ever read? And you're just like, whoa, it just hit, the bar is so high. And he puts the bar high for us because we do it in his power and his strength. And so Jesus reveals God's glory. He is, Hebrews 1 says, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So where's Jesus? He's at the right hand of God, at the majesty, at the creator. He's sitting there making intercession for you and me. And, and what is, what, what's the most important thing that we can see in this verse? Well, there's a lot. But if we want to talk about what he did for us, it's the purification of sin. And that that's the only reason we can glorify God is because of Jesus and what he did as he glorified God on the cross. Jesus reveals God's glory. Next one is that Jesus reflects God's glory. And he said, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So what he did glorified the Father. We are the benefactors of his work on the cross. How about, do you remember that story? It's in Mark chapter 9. Well, it's in a couple of the Gospels. But Jesus went up to the mountaintop and he put, took Peter, James, and John, his top three guys with him, his inner circle. And, and so they go up to the mountain, and then all of a sudden, these, this person appears, and this person, it's Moses and Elijah. And so they're all talking. Can you imagine this? Whoa, this is a lot. And then Peter's like, you know, he's the first to put his foot in his mouth. But in fairness, he's the first to always act and respond. He's got a lot of courage, and I admire that about him because I put my foot in my mouth a lot too. But he steps up and he just says this. He says, well, hey, let's make three tabernacles. And then out of heaven, it just said, this is my beloved son. And then Moses and Elijah are gone. And Jesus is just standing there like this. And then do you remember what comes next? Because it's an awesome passage. I want to read it to you. It says in Mark chapter 9. And this is so good that I want to read it to you. It says this. After Jesus, after God said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. It says in verse 8, I didn't want to get it wrong. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. Jesus only. Say that with me. Jesus only. He's the glory of God. Jesus only. I don't need anything else. Jesus only. I don't need to be worried. Jesus only. I don't need to, I don't need, I only need him. Jesus only. I can overcome anything. Because he glorified the son, or God glorified him, and he glorifies us as we seek to live like him. So let's hit three things that we got to do. So let's go to us now. I think it's going to us. Next one is this. Jesus reflects God's glory. We need to reflect God's glory. So, so whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, um, 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, do all to the glory of God. So we want to give him the glory. It's not about us. It's about him. Would you be so open to confess in your workplace before the people that you work for that you're not that good, that you don't have it all together, just like I did on this stage and made a joke about it? but you're on a stage. And if you're a follower of Christ, you don't really bring as much to the table as you think you do. And if you are, you're not living in his strength because he wants to do more. And so we're called to glorify him. So what does it mean? Glorify God when you're flipping burgers, man. Glorify God when you're selling real estate. Glorify God if you're scrubbing toilets. Glorify God is whatever you're doing. 
You're building your business. You're called to glorify God. Whatever you do, you're an engineer. You're working on yourself, figuring everything out. Smartest people in the room. Kidding. My dad was an engineer. You glorify God while you're doing it. You're a mom. You're a dad. You're glorifying God as you raise these kids. They're not yours. They're his. That should be extremely freeing to you. (laughs) I'm at the stage where we've given them back to the Lord. Lord, you take them. We'll take the grandkids. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) But seriously, like, like, like that's what we're called to do, to glorify our Father in heaven. So we want to reflect God's glory. What else do we do? There's two more. We need to share God's glory. So this is the evangelism part. Um, Easter letdown. Everybody comes. Awesome, man. I mean, if I told you how many hours we planned those services, Good Friday and, and Easter, you, you'd be like, like, you're like, when do you start that? When do you start planning for um, Good Friday and Easter? How about the minute we walk out the door on Easter? I'm thinking about next year. Oh, Lord, what are we going to be able to do? We've got to feed the monster. They want more. I'm kind of kidding, but our team, like six, eight months before, they're thinking, they're meeting, they're, because they, this is the big thing, man, we want you to invite your friends, and it isn't about what we do, it's what God does through us, and Easter letdown is, you know, I mean, you were here on Easter, weren't you? You were at home. We got, all, we got a lot of chairs. That's every pastor. And again, I'm not, but now I'll, be, I'll be honest, the last two weeks and just looking even today, last week was, we were like, whoa, this is pretty good. People came back. Talked to a couple people in the lobby. People came back. We're about inviting people. We're not just telling you to invite people at Easter. That's not glorifying God. I'm telling you, you got a friend, you got a neighbor, this is a great series to invite them to. Who you are, who you really are in Christ. I promise I won't be talking about money in the next few weeks. Won't turn to Malachi. You know, hey, put your full tithe in the warehouse, and you'll get an email from that on us. But I'm just saying, like, we got to remember that I'm an evangelist at heart, and our locations are here for other people. We've been found to find. It's one of our values at our church, right? And so, so it's not just me. It's like you've got to live that out. And so you've been entrusted with the gospel. And so it's really important. We need to share God's glory. Lastly. For this little section, we need to rejoice in God's glory. And so this is where we're going next. Some of you may have noticed that I was up early. Did anyone notice? Ooh, the pastor is doing the announcements, or he did the check-in. Like, that's unusual. Yes, I didn't want to do it. Craig, he gives me all his jobs. I don't know why. (laughs) Kidding. He does a phenomenal job each week. And and we've got a couple closing announcements today, but... But the reason we did it is because we're going to do this. And so this is the thing. Um, Usually, the worship sets up the word. And then your hearts, and I I come up, and I just, man, I just like, you're melted. You're ready to go. Today, which we need to do more often, the word is setting up the worship. That's what we're doing. And so the word of God... This verse is setting up our worship. So that means don't leave after I'm done. Some of you guys, I'm telling you, I get done preaching at this service. I go over to Wheaton and preach over there. Like, you're in my way. You leave so early. Do you leave your kids here for the second service and then come back? Is that what's really happening? I mean, yeah, we could grab lunch, really quick breakfast. Hey, let's go over to the mall. Let's go over to Ikea, you know? I mean, no, seriously, but we're going to do worship after. And so our worship team, I'm, I'm just cueing them right now. They're getting ready. And uh, you could even come up. And uh, they're, they're going to come up, and they're going to lead us in worship. And, um, and this isn't like, you know, but like, I don't want to, like, this is okay, you know. But it's like the hands in the pockets, the, you know. Like, like could just focus on the Lord. And, and I remember when I first became a Christian, and for many times, um, like, I just remember... And even now, like there's sometimes in worship where I just have to put my head down because I'm so unworthy. And I, I'm all messed up. And I can't even bring myself to acknowledge my own flesh and my own sinfulness and what I did this week. 
that, that the Lord, the creator is here. And the Bible says he inhabits our praises. And then I remember who I am in him. And it's not about what I do, but what he's done. And I remember the forgiveness that he brings and I can release the burden and I can worship him. Not with alligator arms, but, but just to worship him. And I know we're pressing you a little bit. I, I mean, like sometimes the worship is just in the head. And I'm just saying, like, have you learned what real passionate heart worship is? And, and it's really like it's freeing. And it's like electrifying. And, and I, can't, I can't get enough of it. And so we're going to have an opportunity to worship because we need to rejoice. And so how do you do it? You ascribe the Lord glory and strength, as the verse says. You, you ascribe the Lord the glory to his name. And, and so that's what we're going to do. And so we got Judd, we got Bethany, we got the team. And they're, they're going to lead us. But let me give you the, the last thing. Let me clean up the text. Um, I'm redeemed for God's glory. And so remember the reasons. They're right here in the verse. For from him, it's like, okay, I've, I've what is it? I've witnessed it. I've witnessed it personally. And, and through him, I, I, I've, what do we say? I've experienced it supernaturally. And, and, then, and then to him are all things. What was that? I, I've, I've reveled in it unapologetically. And, and then now, to him be the glory forever. Amen. And I'm redeemed for God's glory eternally. Like, for eternity. Like, this is the best news yet. And eternity starts right now. And so maybe you're watching. Maybe you're here with us. Maybe you haven't committed your life to Christ. And maybe you're like, I don't really have an interest in, in, in glorifying God in my workplace or in my life or in my home. Like, ask yourself the serious question. Like, do you, do you have it? Like, have you really made a decision for him? Because I know what it's like to be on the other side of the fence and not really give a rip. And I just be here, you know, okay. But I know what it's like to be over here and be like, I get it. And I've accepted him. And I'm surrendering myself to him. And I'm worshiping him because I've been redeemed for eternity. And so we just want you to celebrate. We want to give you some space. I mean, we got a half an hour left. Ushers are locking the doors. <laughs> Kids are okay. It, it's early. It's not over. I got up really early. And so let me say this. The Apostle Paul says this, and let me paint this last picture before we engage. The chapter, Romans 11, it's really critical. Because what Paul's doing is, is he's answering the question, what about my fellow brothers? What about my fellow Jews? Like the Gentiles get grafted in. And then all of a sudden, like, like the Jews are the ones that denied Christ, right? That's what happened. And, and then Paul's answering, well, God's got a plan for them too. And, and so Paul's heart, if you've ever seen Paul's heart, it's Romans 11. Because he talks about, no, God's not done with anyone. God's not done with the Jews. Like thankfully. And... Uh, Lord, help us in our country today. Lord, help us to understand that God did reveal himself to the Jewish people. He did. And guess what? They are still God's people. And Paul's like, I'm a Jew. That's what he says in verse 1 of Romans chapter 11. He says, I'm a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. He, he hasn't. And so how do we look at that? Well, there's a lot of theology there, but think about it. The biggest anguish that Paul had is about those who he loved that didn't know Jesus. And that's the same with us. Whether they're whatever they are, they're Jewish, they're Muslim, it doesn't matter. Like, do you have a heart for others to come to Christ? Like, that's what he's saying. And then look what he does. No matter what your trial is, no matter your misunderstanding, because people are misunderstanding God's heart, however you're mis... I'm, I'm mad at God because of this situation at work. I'm mad at God because of what happened to me in the divorce. I'm mad at God because I lost that loved one. Like, like look what Paul, Whatever it is, Paul says this in verse 33. 
Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? And then our verse. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory. To him be the glory. So that what that means to us is that he knows more than me in the midst of the situation. He knows better than me, even though I think I know more. And I just got to surrender myself to him. And I got to look up. And I got to praise him for who he is. And so as you stand to your feet, if you're able, Father, lead us in worship. May your word prepare our hearts for our lips to praise your name.